Kevin Brady, President of the American Institute for History Education, and I would like to welcome you here to AIHE TV at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Our guest today uh, that we have are Peter Ernest, who is a se former senior executive with the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, and the executive director of the museum, and also Major General Oleg Kalugin, who was a executive with the Soviet Foreign Intelligence Service, also known as the KGB, in the United States, and he was the head of the KGB operations in our country. Mr. Ernest, can you tell us why or why is it critical, or do you think it is critical, for students today to study the Soviet-American rivalry um, over the last 50 years, and especially why students should study about espionage and spies and, and the uh, relationships between those? Sure. Well, I think there are several things there. Uh, one is in studying uh, the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States over the last number of years, particularly through what is called the Cold War, uh, I think it's important always for students, young or old, to have a sense of their past. Where do things come from? Because nothing starts brand new. There's always a history to it. There's roots to it. And I think in, in the case of understanding the Cold War, understanding that relationship, I would take a sentence out of President Obama's speech in accepting the Nobel Prize that we need to see the world as it is, not as we would like it to be. So I think it's important that in a, at a time when there are so many um, attempts to label things one or another, that it's good to look at things with, a, with the idea of understanding them. Why was there this rivalry? It didn't come from nowhere. What was the nature of it? Did it actually bring us close to nuclear war, as some people have said? And to what extent did espionage or intelligence writ large, so I don't mean just spies, but overhead reconnaissance and other things, to what extent did that play a role in how the Cold War went and how it turned out? I think those things are critical for a student to then take on the 21st century and his or her own time and why things are happening the way they do. And that, after all, is why we study history. Well, let me uh, add to what Peter has just said. Uh, the Cold War was essentially a war of ideology, ideologies, I would say, uh, of uh, two political and economic systems in which the Soviet Union at that time uh, presented itself as uh, the future of humanity, based on Marxist theories that socialism, communism will eventually prevail and triumph, uh, that what the Soviets, after the uh, World War II, in which uh, Russia emerged as a, a victorious nation. And that added to Russian ambitions to challenge the United States, which also emerged in the world as the number one uh, international entity and uh, challenged the Soviet claims to the future of humanity. So that was the essence of uh, the Cold War, ideological uh, war in the first place, but also with many other uh, elements of uh, the war uh, short of a, I mean, regular war. But regular war at that time was really beyond um, understanding of the people. We would inevitably get into a nuclear conflict. And that what stopped the Soviets and the United States uh, from uh, a regular war, which would I say uh, be a disaster for the whole of humanity. The Cold War was in effect an attempt to weaken uh, the Western world and to eventually advance the Soviet cause across the world. We actually, after World War II, moved to Eastern Europe. We occupied Eastern Europe. We tried to uh, win the friends all over the world. Then the emergence of the Chinese People's Republic public on the east made Russia feel that we are on the right track and some other nations later in Africa and then the appearance of Cuba that all showed in the right direction according to the Soviet political you know uh, um, theories and po political figures who believed this is the uh, advance of a Soviet s socialist system across the world and the United States has to be treated as enemy number one that was precisely the definition of the United States at the peak of the Cold War, enemy number one. I think it's important for, for uh, folks to understand that the Soviet Union at the time, 
was a tremendous military uh, and political force in the world. And among the most formidable weapons uh, that the Soviet Union had was the ideology it was promoting, which yes, was socialism, as General Kalugin explained, but it was communism, which is a, a pure ideology uh, which the Soviet Union was promoting around the world and in our country. And so we weren't just concerned about a political military entity, the Soviet Union, but we were also very concerned about the spreading influence uh, of communism where it was taking root, where it was galvanizing people to enter into revolution in their own countries, uh, certainly Cuba being an example. Today we're dealing in some cases with, uh, with forces which are manifest themselves in the form of terrorism, and in some cases they're not states, but they, are, they exercise a weapon called terrorism, and they are also, in exercising terrorism, actually targeting Americans and others in what I would call the, the democratic uh, world um, as targets specifically to kill. And I think it's important to understand that whereas General Kalugin and I were representatives of different systems, we were not seeking to assassinate one another. Our systems were in conflict. And each of us did something on behalf of our systems against the other. Propaganda, trying to recruit people and so forth, but not specifically the idea of what I would call terrorist activities. And I think that's an important distinction to make between what we dealt with in the Cold War and what we're dealing with today as we do this, uh, this discussion. General Kalugin, can you tell us some of the various uh, institutions in the United States that the KGB had infiltrated, maybe things like uh, the media, the churches, government? At the peak of the Cold War, uh, before the collapse of the USSR, actually in the uh, 40s and 50s, uh, to be more precise, uh, the Soviet intelligence had assets in every sphere of American public and government life. We penetrated the United States government uh, in the former Office of Strategic Services, the precursor of the CIA. We had some 26 sources. Well, in fact, by 1953, uh, the Soviet intelligence uh, handled uh, more than 300 sources in the United States in uh, every sphere of American life, in science, national economy, government, federal government, local governments. Uh, uh, and the United States did not have a single spy inside the USSR. So the score was 300 to zero before 1953. But I think what is important for, uh, for us to understand here is that in the run-up to World War II, uh, when the Soviet Union was promoting communism throughout the world, seeking to spread its influence through its own agents, we did not have, in the run-up to World War II, any sort of national intelligence organization. We only developed one as a country during World War II, and that was the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, and that carried out sabotage and other operations in Europe and in the Pacific. After World War II, uh, it was when after us OSS had been dissolved, our leadership realized we need to have some sort of national organization that lets us know what is happening in the world uh, on a regular basis. Because we never wanted another Pearl Harbor to happen, a surprise attack, and we wanted to know uh, as much as we could about the other world and who was seeking to carry out subversion or operations in our country. And that's when the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, was created in 1947. That became the premier organization for taking information from other mechanisms, mechanisms we had, analyzing it, and giving it to the policymakers, being the President, uh, Secretary of State, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So in looking at those numbers, we had zero agents, that is assets, if you want to call them, in Moscow, in the Soviet Union. We didn't even try. 
Hmm. During World War II, the Russians, the Soviets, were our ally. So we did not spy against them. There was, there was no effort. We were not trying to import, uh, export an ideology such as communism. Yes, we were for de democracy and we promoted that, but not in a subversive way. And that was the difference between the two systems. That is, the Soviet Union was seeking by subversion and secret agents to both extend its influence and promote communism. We were not trying to do that. We did not have such an agency until the CIA in 1947, and so our efforts at even creating agents of the kind that General Kalugin's talking about were nil up until that point. Um, General, uh I had heard you speak before of what would possibly have happened if Henry Wallace had become president instead of Harry Truman, or if uh, FDR had passed away before the, um, the election of, of, of 1944, and, and talking about other, uh, that the Soviets had people planted in the United States government, and what effect would that have? Can you uh, elaborate on that, son? The Soviet uh, Union and its intelligence services took advantage of the uh, 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 defeat of Germany and uh, Soviet triumph to uh, promote the Soviet system as the most promising and most attractive. And since the United States emerged uh, after World War II as the only uh, adversary, I mean, one which would stand in the way of Soviet designs on the world domination. So the United States would become inevitably uh, enemy number one. And uh, the Soviet intelligence did all it could to undermine uh, the prestige, uh, the uh, American system, uh, uh, the role of America in World War II, and of course, uh, to picture the United States as an imperialist nation which wants to dominate the world and exploit the mercilessly uh, the poor people in uh, the third world countries. Actually, the appeal was primarily to the uh, developing nations because once the Soviets were stopped in Europe when they hoped they would go all the way after World War II, I mean, in the wake of the defeat of Germany, all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. But, uh, well, the in, uh, involvement of the Western nations uh, uh, since the Normandy, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, sort of uh, landing of uh, the Western uh, tr troops fighting Germany, uh, we s ha were actually were stopped and Germany was divided. Austria remained for a while a piece of, uh, the sort of split into several parts. Uh, America's determination to stop the Soviet expansionism was indeed uh, uh, accompanied by, um, uh, well, nuclear, Mm, uh, well, uh, uh, developments, uh, and it was clear for the Soviets that if we go further in our efforts to expand the Soviet empire, there may be a nuclear disaster. Actually, the Cuban cr crisis uh, uh, of the early 60s, when the Soviets tried to install some uh, uh, intermediate-range uh, missiles on the Cuban territories, and uh, uh, that attempt was uh, thwarted by the United States and uh, John F. Kennedy at that time took a very tough stand and Khrushchev tried to, uh, well, scare I mean, the people of the United States uh, by uh, talking about Soviet uh, dominance in the uh, missile, I mean, intercontinental missile area, but he was bluffing and one of the American sources at that time who had access to the military sixes provided the true picture of the Soviet military standing and that allowed President Kennedy and the United States government to take, I mean, vigorous actions to stop, uh, uh, you know, turning Cuba into a major military ba base for the USSR. So uh, that penetration of, of critical, uh, really, nature in the Cold War business and subsequent successes of the CIA uh, really uh, made it impossible for the Soviets to, uh, well, carry out the plans and designs they had worked on for decades. Well, with the collapse of the USSR, all these uh, plans and designs, well, just simply collapsed altogether.
Mr. Ernest, what, can you tell some of the, uh, our audience who, uh, and, and teachers really like to, 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 to hear this and, our, and, and the students, uh, what your role was in the CIA and some interesting stories that you may want to share with them? Well, I think that uh, one of the things that, that I often get asked is how I came to join the CIA, how I came to be in the CIA. I got out of Georgetown University, uh, having studied history and government, with the idea probably of, of going into law or the Foreign Service. Uh, I served a period in the military, uh, at which time I was approached by the CIA. I was then serving in Japan with the Marine Corps. And none of us knew anything about the CIA because the movies and the books and television, it, it simply was not a subject. I mean, it was a sort of a hush-hush subject. And so I was given to understand by the people that recruited me that it had to deal with uh, our involvement in, in what was the early years of the Cold War, confronting the Soviet Union concerns about communism. So as they say, it seemed like a good idea at the time. So I joined and it became a 35-year career. It was a wonderful career. I felt very much at the front lines of what my country was about. Uh, for us in the agency and other intelligence places, we did feel we were at war. It's called the Cold War. But there were <clears throat> conflicts around the world, whether it was Korea or Vietnam, and eventually Afghanistan and so forth. These were hot wars, uh, but there were also influence operations and so forth. <clears throat> in the CIA, I was in what is called today the National Clandestine Service. That is the part of the CIA <clears throat> that deals with secret operations, both recruiting agents to gain information, as well as what we call act, covert action, uh, and that is influence operations, all the way from propaganda to helping the special forces in Afghanistan. <clears throat> that was about 25 years of my 35-year career. And, and I think this is good for young people to know is that I also had the opportunity then to serve in other capacities. I was with our inspector general for about two to three years, two and a half years, I headed up our staff dealing with the U.S. Senate, the oversight committees. I helped uh, oversee support to the trials of the spies in the 1980s, the so-called decade of the spy. And I was eventually the director of media relations, dealing, dealing with all the press and authors and so forth, uh, for the agency and spokesman. And that was for three directors, uh, Jim Woolsey, who is now on our board here, uh, Judge William Webster, who had headed, the only man to head the FBI and the CIA, who's also on our board, and uh, Bob Gates, who's now the Secretary of Defense. And uh, it was a privilege to serve with all of them. It was an extraordinary experience, and uh, I, I cannot recommend a career in intelligence highly enough in terms of serving your country and sort of being at the front lines of seeing where things were going on. General Kalugan, how about you? Is there? Uh, can you tell our audience, uh, you know, uh, what you had done for the KGB in the United States, and relate some experience and stories with uh, some people like uh, uh, Gorbachev and Yeltsin, and also maybe tell a little bit about your experience with Boris Yeltsin in front of the tanks uh, that were rolling down the streets of, or stopped in the streets of Moscow. Well, I joined the KGB as a volunteer in 1952 after graduation from high school and I spent six years in training under the auspices of the KGB. I studied international relations, three foreign languages, history of uh, uh, the regions I was supposed to uh, get involved uh, with, I mean as a spy. Uh, so um, in uh, 58 when I graduated finally with Arabic as my main language, uh, and I was supposed to go to Egypt, my first assignment abroad. Uh, uh, abruptly, I, uh, my uh, trip was canceled, uh, and I was offered to come to the United States as a Fulbright Scholar. So that changed my career dramatically. I came to Columbia University School of Journalism, where I spent a year, uh, and I was featured in the New York Times at that time uh, because uh, I was elected to the Students' Council of Columbia University, the first student ever elected to the 
uh, any uh, student body of the United States um, University, I mean. And uh, uh, that uh, propelled my career, and partly also because when I was a student, I recruited my first uh, source in the United States with access to classified information. Um, it was accidental almost, uh, but I took advantage of the guy's willingness to share with the Soviets uh, uh, the knowledge and um, uh, production, I mean uh, classified information and even uh, solid fuel for missiles, which at that time was of crucial importance in the space uh, race between the USSR and the United States. Later I came back again to the United States as a Radio Moscow correspondent. That was my new cover, uh, I mean, consistent with my background, School of Journalism. And uh, for four years, I've been involved in the recruitment process in New York City, as well as uh, special uh, disinformation operations, uh, uh, which would uh, make the United States government look as uh, criminal and uh, uh, totally uh, corrupt. And we took advantage of the U.S. Uh, media. I mean, the freedom of the press in this country allows you to manipulate and make stories uh, much more <laughs> fa fancy and, <laughs> and I mean, uh, 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 damaging to the United States as a society and the government. So that's what I was involved in uh, for several years. Uh, later, uh, in 64, I had to go back home because of the defection of one of the KGB officers. And uh, I thought I would never come to the United States. But then again, my record was pretty good, and I was suggested to go back now as deputy chief of KGB operations in the United States with my base in Washington, uh, the press officer of the Soviet embassy in the United States. Uh, and in this capacity, I uh, handled a few interesting cases. Uh, particularly one uh, from the National Security Agency, Robert Lipka, a guy who volunteered and offered, uh, well, uh, really uh, bags, uh, literally, of information uh, stuffed uh, from the uh, uh, National Security Agency where he had, uh, was supposed to destroy the, these right. papers and he would uh, pass it to the Soviet intelligence. Uh, but perhaps the most uh, important case in my career in Washington was that of John Walker, uh, a man who worked for the uh, Naval uh, Cryptographic Division. And as a result of uh, his work, we managed to obtain the code, uh, I mean, uh, uh, codes of the United States uh, military. And for many years, uh, really, uh, decoded thousands of pieces of classified information. And John Walker uh, himself uh, built a, um, uh, a sort of a family of spies, including his son and his son-in-law. So that was uh, one of the most remarkable parts of my career. But I, stood, I took over, I mean, I actually stood at the inception of that program. I mean, Walker's case. Uh, but that uh, propelled my career again. And uh, when I came back to Moscow, I uh, was uh, promoted uh, two steps over normal promotion, became deputy and then chief of foreign counterintelligence with nearly 700 officers under my command. But uh, perhaps more important uh, for my own record, when I took over, we had about 180 foreign sources, primarily in intelligence and counterintelligence of the world. By the end of my uh, stint at that, in that organization, we had 500 sources. Well, in fact, when I uh, uh, was relieved of my duties in the intelligence and sent to the domestic service as number two man in St. Petersburg's field office, uh, that really turned me around. I was a convicted and dedicated communist, but I worked against the West, and I knew the West pretty well. Now my job was to uh, investigate my own people who were unhappy and uh, wanted a change. And I had to put them either in psychiatric institution or jail because they would not to be willing to play along. So that turned me away totally from uh, the Soviet system, and I was the first to in the KGB to speak uh, 
um, uh, honestly about the problems we had. And Mr. Gorbachev, who came to power and actually encouraged me and many other people by saying that it's time to open our society and to tell the truth to the world and to ourselves. And that's what I did. I took Gorbachev literally. <laughs> well, probably a little prematurely. Well, anyway, I became a public critic of the KGB. And Mr. Gorbachev treated me on my rank and decorations. I was nearly put in jail, but I was saved from uh, imprisonment by the people of Russia. I was elected a member of the Soviet parliament, obtained immunity from prosecution. And this new capacity as a political figure, I would travel around the world and, and to talk about the need of total uh, dismantling of the Soviet system. Well, as Yeltsin emerged uh, um, as a political leader, uh, and Gorbachev lost uh, control of the country, the Soviet Union fell apart, and, well, Yeltsin became uh, uh, the president of Russia, independent sovereign country. I was offered the job of a KGB chairman. I refused. I was a political figure. I did not care anymore about the KGB. And in that capacity, I remained active um, until 95, when it was clear that um, uh, the Yeltsin, who was an honest but erratic uh, man, uh, unpredictable in some ways, uh, well, drinking too much, uh, that uh, spoiled many things um, around him and uh, the idea of reforms was also viewed by many as a, a launched by a man who was not sober. Well, that led to uh, uh, my decision to accept an invitation. I was involved in business uh, at the time. Uh, Gorbachev totally rehabilitated me. I was involved in business, uh, and we launched a major uh, joint venture in the United States with AT&T. And I came to the United States in 95 for a three-year contract. I did not plan to stay here forever. I had family, everything back home, I mean. And uh, well, but uh, things started to change in Russia after uh, Yeltsin's uh, retirement. Uh, my former subordinate, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Putin, became uh, director of the Russian Security Service at some point. And uh, uh, he publicly uh, stated, uh, once, once he became uh, the, the director, uh, he called me traitor publicly. I called him a war criminal. And I said that he will uh, face the International Court of Justice, just like Mr. Milosevic of Yugoslavia for the uh, atrocities committed against the people of Chechnya. So that was the beginning of my rupture, I mean, with the current regime. And I, uh, uh, well, uh, remained beyond the three-year contract with AT&T. And my friends told me, don't come back home because you may be jailed or whatever. So I stayed here. I did not plan to stay forever. But uh, in 2001, after the... Uh, attack on the United States uh, by the terrorists. But President Bush uh, looked into the eyes of Mr. Putin and they read each other's souls and I felt a little uneasy and nervous about my future. But, uh, well, nothing happened. Uh, and uh, in the end, uh, uh, with the Putin administration uh, uh, sort of um, uh, totally in control of the country, I faced a choice uh, and I chose to stay in the United States and eventually applied for citizenship which was granted to me and that was the greatest event in my life. We're so pleased that General Kalugin also agreed to become a member of our board and he has been one of the, the strongest members of our board in understanding intelligence and its role in, in uh, national security whether it was his former country or this country. and. Uh, we're very pleased he got his citizenship. Thank and, you, Peter. Uh, I would say, too, that uh, he is a resource for our country because he has continued to be available uh, to speak out publicly, whether it's interviews or to groups, teachers, and so forth. So he, he has become for us, I think, a, an asset, a national asset. And during the period that I was in CIA, my initial uh, involvement of, was that of what is called a clandestine services officer. Uh, we call those case officers or operations officers. And uh, I went through a period of training. It's, a, it's an area we call the farm, uh, frequently referred to in literature. But you deal with many things, whether it's how to spot surveillance, how to conduct surveillance, uh, recruiting people uh, to become assets. And it's very, very important learning to communicate well, writing reports, speaking, uh, understanding information quickly.
And when I completed that, uh, I was then uh, went out very quickly to the field. I spent virtually all of my time, uh, which was uh, 11 years overseas in Europe and in the Middle East. Uh, during those periods, I was under some one form of cover or another. That means that when I was in the field, as we call it, I was not identified as a CIA officer. I was identified as perhaps some sort of U.S. official or, or uh, an independent uh, businessman of some kind. And in that capacity, I was involved in meeting people to determine if they might be willing to become covert, that is secret, assets, sources for the American government, obviously through the CIA and through me. So that was a fundamental, that was an important part of what I did. The other part of what I did, I was in deeply involved in covert action uh, operations, uh, particularly concerning the Soviet Union. And that is, we were trying to send materials into the Soviet Union. Uh, we were supporting radio broadcasts. Uh, we were sending in individual agents. We were publishing materials. We would do the same thing later in helping East Europe free itself. We would help the Polish Solidarność, the Solidarity Movement. So those were the kinds of specific things that we did. And you have to understand that when I say I recruited people as sources of information, you also have to recruit people, and we call them our agents. You also have to recruit people to conduct covert action. In other words, if you are going to influence a, a publication, perhaps you have to recruit a reporter on that publication or an editor on that publication. So I was involved in that. Uh, in a broad uh, number of things. I dealt, this was the beginnings of some of our modern terrorism. I did handle a, a, a major a terrorism figure. Um, I also uh, was responsible for later in my career uh, handling the resettlement of the highest ranking uh, individual from the Soviet Union, a man named Shevchenko, Arkady Shevchenko, who was then a very senior officer in the uh, UN, a deputy undersecretary general. And uh, he had been an agent of ours for some two years in New York at the UN, defected, and then uh, we needed to uh, both protect him, we were concerned that uh, the Soviets might seek to take action against him, uh, and then to help him resettle uh, in this country. And so all of those things that I did operationally uh, became very valuable for me when I then represented the agency uh, on the Hill and with the media because I had, uh, as it were, been there and done that. I, I knew uh, what I had to represent. So I think my career in, involved such different facets that that was what made it so interesting. There is nothing that we take more strongly in the museum here than our, our educational mission. Mm -hmm. And so both for the, 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 the schools who visit here in considerable numbers, uh, even individual students, we have workbooks and so forth for them to use in understanding the artifacts and understanding the story we're telling at the museum. But one thing we have focused on uh, in, in the past uh, couple of years, and we have just published, by the way, a publication called Minute by Minute. And this is a publication designed for use uh, either here at the museum with teachers or students here, or even off-site, because we, I have gone off-site with our staff members and uh, trained with this edition. It is a remarkable work, because what it does is take the Cuban Missile Crisis as a case study and the students actually work their way through it. That the instructor presents the crisis as it arose and said, all right, now here is the crisis. Here is the building evidence of the Soviet buildup in Cuba. Photographs, CIA documents that are classified, overhead photographs by U-2 airplanes and the Air Force. And we then uh, uh, ask the students to analyze the situation and see what they can understand and what they would advise policymakers if they were put in the position of seeing this evidence 
and advising policymakers, because that's what intelligence does. That's the role of intelligence. And so we've been very pleased with this. As I said, um, here's another booklet just to, to show you. And that, again, is a booklet designed uh, for school groups that come here. And it's a, it's a combination workbook and narrative of some uh, spy, spy uh, information, anecdotal uh, in nature. But I think this idea of, of taking this out to teachers, out to students, or here, uh, is something we've really embraced. We are also looking at, at making this available through distance learning. So that'll be our next step in expanding uh, our educational reach. Oh, excellent, Peter. I um, want to say that I have read these materials as and as a former high school teacher and college, uh, you know, and, and college uh, professor. Uh, I think they're they're phenomenal. We are going to be using this material in some of our professional development so that we can make sure that teachers get this, that students have this material, and we also and we uh, are going to be bringing students and teachers to the Spy Museum to be able to go through and experience the fabulous, fantastic fantastic uh, exhibits that you have here and we've been doing that for the past few years and the right now schools are lining up and teacher uh, organizations are lining up to, to, to come here. Well the other thing they can do Kevin is they can go directly to our website which is www.spymuseum.org and they can download lesson plans on things like terrorism in, in America which is our traveling exhibit right now. So they can go to the website and see what is available. This of course is is available when people, uh, when we are teaching, either here or outside. It's also available in our, in our retail outlet here at the museum. Gentlemen, I'd really like to thank you for these marvelous stories. And I strongly encourage teachers to give students the opportunity to investigate the Cold War, to investigate espionage, and to investigate and learn about heroic spies that have phenomenal tales like this that have taken pl place over the last 40, 50, 60 years. And I'd also like to strongly encourage teachers and everybody out there to come to Washington, D.C. to see this phenomenal museum and to go to the website at www.spymuseum.org for materials that you can use in your classroom or you can use with your children. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again on AIHE TV.